Okay, uh, can you uh, stand up, please? Uh, please, the other jury. Okay. Uh, can you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear you will dil diligently inquire and true pre pre presentment make according to your charge of all offenses against the laws of the state committed or tribal in this country of which you have or can obtain legal evidence, the counsel of your state, your fellows and your own, you further swear that you will present no one for any hatred, malice or ill will, neither will you leave unpresented anyone for love, fair, favor or affection or for any reward or the hope or promise thereof but that you will present things truly as they come to your knowledge to the best of your understanding according to the laws of the state. What do you say? I do. I do. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, our brothers and sisters, uh, as I would have indicated, uh, we are here in the matter of the, the black community of St. Louis versus Darren Wilson. Welcome to the Black People's Grand Jury Proceedings. We are here because the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement recently decided to conduct a Black People's Grand Jury to determine the case of the August 9, 2014 murder of Mike Brown by First <coughs> Officer Darren Wilson. The state convened the Grand Jury and that Grand Jury decided not to bring any charges against Officer Darren Wilson. However, we submit that the prosecutors could have corrupted those proceedings in the presentation of their case to the grand jury. And on that basis, the grand jury's decision to not indict Officer Wilson with a criminal offense was not a proper decision. We know that those proceedings were corrupted because Prosecutor Rob Paul McCullough publicly admitted that he presented evidence he knew to be false to the grand jury considering charges against Officer Darren Wilson. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the jury, it is the grand jury's function not to inquire upon what foundation the charge may be denied or otherwise to try the suspect's defenses, but only to examine upon what foundation the charge is made. McCullough did the opposite of this by allowing Officer Darren Vinson to testify at length in an attempt to justify his actions. The way the prosecutors presented the evidence was a deliberate attempt to not indict Wilson, and it shows the preferential treatment given to law enforcement. The Black People's Grand Jury is made up of 12 persons from this community. The people's advocates in this matter are Chairman Omali Yeshitela, uh, Zaki Muruti, Attorney Aaron O'Neill, and myself, Attorney Alex Money. In these proceedings, you will hear direct evidence and circumstances relating to the murder of Michael Brown and evidence and witnesses related to the colonial relationship that black people have with state power in Missouri. A grand jury is a legal body that is empowered to conduct official legal proceedings to investigate potential criminal conduct and to determine whether charges should be brought. The grand jury has two functions, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. The grand jury has an investigative function and, a, and an accusatory function. The investigative function includes obtaining and reviewing of documents and other evidence and hearing the sworn testimony of witnesses that appear before it. The accusatory function is to determine whether or not there is probable cause to believe one or more persons committed a certain offense. Probable cause, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the jury, is knowledge of facts and circumstances sufficient for a prudent person to believe a suspect is committing or has committed an offense, i.e. reasonable belief. So probable cause is reasonable belief. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you may believe that there is probable cause to charge Officer Wilson with murder in that he knowingly caused the death of Mike Brown after deliberation on the matter. Or 
you may believe that there is probable cause to charge Officer Wilson with second degree murder, wherein a person knowingly causes the death of another person. To act knowingly means to act in a manner that produces a result. In this case, the result is death. Or you may decide that probable cause has not been established and that no charges should be brought against Darren Wilson, Officer, Officer Wilson. Or you may decide that the prosecutors in the, in the state's grand jury proceedings should be, should be charged with hindering prosecution in that they either they pre uh, prevented or obstructed or did something de deceitful that prevented the apprehension of, 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 this, of this individual. The people's prosecutors will present evidence, but the grand jury may ask uh, questions after the prosecutors. Witnesses will testify before the grand jury about their involvement in, in this matter, and the people's prosecutors will direct the evidence. Exhibits may be presented to the grand jury through the use of, through the use of video, and uh, this is something that normally happens within a, a, a legal proceedings, grand jury proceedings. Uh, videos are presented uh, uh, to the jury, and sometimes it really happens in cases where witnesses are in fear of their lives, and they can't really come to court to speak and, and, give, and give that testimony. So these are the circumstances that we are dealing with in this case. In these proceedings, you will have evidence from a witness who was with, who was with Michael Brown on, on, on August 9th when he was killed. Uh, you will have evidence, a statement from a forensic pathologist. You will have evidence, uh, the evidence that was given by Officer Darren Wilson. You will have evidence from a, a senior, uh, experienced uh, uh, police officer. You will have evidence from a St. Louis historian, from a St. Louis historian, and you will have evidence from victims of police violence here in this community. Ladies and uh, gentlemen of the jury, those are the obligations that uh, we have put before you, and we ask that you uh, just consider all of the evidence that, uh, that we are going to present, and uh, just uh, use your, your good judgment to, to, to make the, the best decision as, as, as you believe is possible. Now we're going to have uh, the other pros uh, pro prosecutors are going to uh, present uh, uh, an, an opening address to you. Thank you, Attorney Morley, uh, for opening up this grand jury proceeding and to also uh, express my deep and most profound appreciation uh, to the jury uh, that has come uh, to recognize your civic responsibility to this community of African people here in St. Louis County. <laughs> I know that this is not uh, the most this is not the easiest uh, thing to do. Um, there, are, there is evidence all around us of the kind of complications and problems associated with African people assuming a responsibility for our existence, for our lives. Um, and I'm highly appreciative of the fact that you are here. From what you've heard already, one of the things that should be clear is that we do, do not believe it is possible uh, to make a judgment about the case of Darren Wilson uh, and Michael Brown's death uh, uh, out of some historical context. That uh, there was some history that despite the fact that Michael Brown and Darren Wilson did not know each other personally, there is a history, uh, an institutionalized relationship that exists uh, between the police department uh, here uh, and the African community here. You will hear testimony uh, in that respect. The other thing is I think that we have a higher responsibility here that most people in our community, that is to say the African community, uh, have our most immediate responsibility with the government uh, in the form of the police. Uh, people who live uh, on Canfield, 
uh, most opportunity they had to have a relationship with the government, that arm of the government was the police. It's not like uh, people uh, had regular uh, opportunity to be uh, with, the, with the city council or even with other elected officials in the government. Uh, there will be uh, testimony about just the numbers of people who Africans uh, uh, in Ferguson and in St. Louis County uh, who have uh, these unreasonable encounters uh, with the state in the form of the police. How uh, the city of Ferguson acquired uh, at least 6% of the municipal income through stopping, uh, arresting, charging uh, black people who live uh, in the city of Ferguson. There is uh, an institutional relationship that is older uh, than Mike Brown was, that is older uh, than Darren Wilson, and that uh, precedes uh, the contact that these two men had uh, with each other on August 9th of 2014. But I think that's part of what it is extremely important for us to say. And we don't think it's possible to understand uh, this question of what happened on August 9th if it is only understood uh, as an encounter that happened between two individuals who happened uh, to encounter each other. We think, uh, as it has already been mentioned, uh, the, the process itself was extraordinarily corrupt, this grand jury process, where uh, Sandra McElroy, uh, also known as witness number 40, was allowed to testify over a two-day period uh, in a fashion that uh, justified or validated Darren Wilson's uh, testimony that somehow the wounded, the already wounded Mike Brown, uh, head down, arms outstretched, charged him uh, like a tackler on a football team. Uh, Bob McCullough uh, announced that he knew that this woman was lying, uh, who testified before the grand jury. Um, he knew that she not only uh, did not see what she said, but she was not even present when Mike Brown uh, was killed. Um, she also it has uh, been revealed is a person that initiated a fundraiser to reward Darren Wilson, to raise money for Darren Wilson after the shooting of Mac Brown. And she has subsequently said that she was in Ferguson on that day uh, because she wanted to be there to learn how to stop calling black people niggers and to learn how to call us people. This is the person that Bob McCullough allowed to testify over two days uh, to this grand jury. There were others. Uh, as I mentioned, he stated himself that he knew that uh, there were witnesses that he brought forward that were lying uh, to this grand jury. So. Uh, we say that it was tainted. And we cannot overlook the fact that McCullough's, Robert McCullough's father, his mother, his brother, his uncle, and his cousin all worked for the St. Louis, so the St. Louis Police Department, and that his father was killed while responding to a call involving an African. The entire process was contaminated, tainted, from beginning to end, which was a basis for a public call by people in the African community for McCullough to be removed from the case. We think it's also worth noting that McCullough did not have to bring down Wilson 
before grand jury. He had possession of another instrument that he could have used. It's called a preliminary hearing. If there is any suggestion that a crime, a felony has been committed, a prosecutor can simply take it to a preliminary hearing, which is a kind of pre-trial where evidence can be presented, debated, witnesses can be questioned, cross-examinations can occur, and it's based on that outcome, a decision can be made whether or not a person should be indicted for trial. That did not happen in this case. And we have a situation instead of this public examination, one that you would have been able to attend just as you are attending this discussion, instead of a public uh, examination, we have a situation where McCullough went behind closed doors and presented tons and tons and tons of evidence absolutely unnecessary uh, and done precisely because it was an attempt to obscure truth as opposed to <coughs> allowing truth to surface. So he went behind closed doors. We have some 5,000 more or more pages of transcripts from that that the public then has an opportunity, should it so desire, to wade through. <coughs> But all that was necessary for an indictment in this case, not 5,000 pages, was the testimony of Doran Johnson. The question was, you go before a grand jury, which, by the way, is a prosecutor's instrument. It is a prosecutor's instrument. Uh, you go before a grand jury uh, with just to prove, show probable cause that a crime has been committed. Dorian Johnson said, I was there. I was walking down the street with Mike Brown when this policeman pulled up and told us to get off the streets and we said we are almost to our destination. And the cop then challenges them and pushes the door open, he says. Uh, in a fashion, they were too close to it, so the door came back and wouldn't open. Doran Dor Johnson said that he saw Darren Wilson gunning down an unarmed 18 year old Mike Brown on August 9th. That was enough for an indictment by itself. But he didn't do that. You will notice. Uh, a careful reading of the transcript shows that the prosecutors during that process <coughs> made every effort throughout to help those testifying come to conclusions that would validate the murder of Mike Brown. What happened with the grand jury in St. Louis County was extraordinary. According to Bureau of Justice statistics, this is on the federal level here, which is slightly different, but not extraordinarily different, we can assume. <coughs> United States prosecutors United States attorneys prosecuted 160,000 cases in 2010. United States attorneys prosecuted 160,000 cases in 2010. The grand jury failed to indict in only 11 of those cases. What happened with the grand jury here was extraordinary. And it was absolutely necessary for prosecutors to work for that outcome, just as they work for every other outcome and every other grand jury that ever occurs, which is why they seldom do not indict.
I think that what is happening here is also important because we see throughout this country immediately before and subsequent to the public execution of Mike Brown on August 9th, a battery of police killings, some most notorious, like Eric Garden in July, the month before, three weeks or so before, who was choked to death in public view, where uh, a video uh, that was taken uh, has been seen by people around the world. We saw <coughs> on October 8th, some few minutes away from where Mike Brown was killed, on 41st and Shaw in St. Louis, Von Derrick Myers gunned down, shot at least eight times, seven times in the back. We've seen the case of Tamir Rice, Cleveland, Ohio, which is a case that shows more clearly than anything why we have to have this grand jury and why we have to be in charge of our own affairs. Because black people, African people, <laughs> coming to a playground where a 12-year-old child is playing with a play gun would not two seconds upon arrival assume that a child 12 years old in a playground with a play gun would be doing anything other than playing that had to be a conclusion that one comes to as an outsider, as someone who sees the community as a problem that has to be solved, as opposed to as a place where human beings live and have shared experiences. So these are some of the things that we think have to go into our deliberations around this case. It is a proceeding that is extraordinarily transparent, moving beyond just the people who are here in this room, but one that is being lastly uh, to people throughout the world. It's not a case where it occurs behind closed doors and nobody knows who went at home during the proceedings or something to that effect. The world can see this. And this grand jury will provide leadership for growing numbers of people around this country who are having to contend with the same thing that we are dealing with here with the case of Mike Brown and Darren Wilson. The question is, what direction do we go? The question is, are we helpless in the face of an unwillingness or inability of the state to respond to our interests? <coughs> this grand jury says that we are not helpless, that we can come together, we can examine the evidence, we can examine the circumstances, we can place the evidence and circumstances in historical context and come to a just conclusion. That's what it is this grand jury does. And we do it in full view of the world. And uh, in face of what we know uh, to be problematic with the mock grand jury that was held by McCullough. And I want to make that point very clear. Lest someone here or any place 
wants to characterize what is happening here today as a mock process. We say the mock process occurred under the leadership of Robert McCollum, the St. Louis County and the state of Missouri. That we are not helpless, we can decide our own fate, we have a responsibility to decide our own fate, and we have a responsibility to provide leadership for those throughout this country who are suffering, experiencing the same problems and contradictions that we're dealing with here. So I want to thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the Black Jury, as well as our public audience. My name is Ike Baruti. I'm the President General of the Universal African People's Organization, as well as a major organizer for the Leadership Coalition for Justice and one of the prosecutors for today. First and foremost, let me say to everyone, you should mark this day down as a very most important historic date. It's a historic date because we, as a people, have declared on this date that we would be self-determinant in terms of the decisions that impact our community. As both lead prosecutors have pointed out so clearly, the so-called grand jury that was convened by Bob McCollum with the support of the governor, Jay Nixon, was a mockery. Let's be absolutely clear, it was a mockery. And as the proceedings go forward, you will see clearly the mockery that existed there and the opportunity to correct that mockery with justice coming from this grand jury. My duty today is kind of to lay out the historic context here in the St. Louis area that led not only to the murder, assassination of Mike Brown, but all of the situations that gave rise to that as it relates to the police encounters with our community. I need to just point out from a historical perspective, St. Louis City, 1983, Marilyn Banks, a young lady sitting on her porch, minding her business, tending to her children, when a white officer and Joseph Ferrario, who had been called for a dispute between two young sisters, when one young sister bolted away whom he knew, whom he knew where she lived, ran down the street. Mind you, the only crime she committed was a dispute with another sister. Ferrario took out his pistol on a mid-evening, shot at her, and missed her and killed the mother of our community. With nothing being done about it, but he did go to trial, I take that back, but found innocent by a predominantly white jury in Kansas City after they had a, uh, a movement of the trial to Kansas City from St. Louis. Mind you, the atmosphere of a Garland Carter being chased by a white officer, Eddie Sanchez, in the middle of the hood in one of our housing projects, shot in the head in a buttocks, but no indictment. And subsequently, the people rose up, and we did have the candidacy of Donnell Smith, but the atmosphere. Mind you, a young brother named Julius Thurman was in the room, was burglarizing the store, but was beat to death where he was beaten so bad that his head was like the size of a football by a white officer, Robert Dotson, and again, no penalty on the officer. Mind you, right next door to Ferguson, in Dalewood, a gentleman named Larry Wayne Turks, who had 
been found hung in the jail. Several days after he had filed complaints with the Justice Department alleging harassment by the Dalewood Police Department. Nothing done on that. Mind you, a young brother named Arthur Dobbins in the community of Pagedale in a confrontation with another police who happened to have the hue of us when one officer had him in a headlock, the other officer pulled the trigger and murdered him. Went to Bob McCullough. What happened? Nothing. Mind you, on the parking lot of the Jack in the Box family restaurant, went some agents from the DEA, as well as from the Dalewood Police Department. <coughs> fired numerous times, over 20-some times, killing both men. One who was the drug suspect for a deal that was supposed to be gone bad, and the other gentleman, Ronald Beasley, which was proven that he was just an innocent bystander, which that was brought to Bob McCullough which again, a failure of an indictment. Mind you, Jerome Ruff, in his walkway, shot dead by the police, for nothing more than running away, no crime. Turn small, let me remind people, a youth who had a toy gun here in St. Louis, shot dead, nothing occurred. Mind you, as brother mentioned, Von Derek Myers. Mind you, Kerry Ball Jr. Shot 25 times after a police chase with witnesses that said that he had his hand in the air seven times in the back. So grand juries, as you look at the evidence, reflect on the historic encounters our people have had with the police force. Understand the historical significance of what we're dealing with. When you look at the composition of the police force in Ferguson, when you have a population that's 67% black and you have 53 officers and only three are black, gives rise to what we are addressing today. Mind you, the climate that has been created when every year studies are done in the state of Missouri to determine whether or not racial traffic, racial profiling through traffic stops exists. And every year for the last 12 years, it has come back that that exists, yet nothing is done to correct it. So, <coughs> ladies of the, and gentlemen of our jury, the black jury, you have a historic duty to examine the evidence that will be presented to you. And upon examining that evidence, we are sure that you will see the need that there are to be murder charges filed against Darren Wilson. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. My name is Aaron O'Neill. Um, I'm just going to share with you some nuts and bolts um, and just sum up what everybody was saying. Um, for one, I just want to reiterate, you know, the historic moment this is and, and your duty uh, as jurors. And I also want to say uh, specifically, uh, I can't do a task, do a task with hearing the evidence in this Darren Wilson case, but we can also find other public officials uh, culpable as well. So I want you to uh, really look at that. Uh, your presence here is essential because we cannot hear the proceedings unless you're all here on time. So that's very important. Uh, also, you're entitled to consider ev the evidence in the light of your own observations and experiences that black people in this black community in St. Louis in the larger area. So I want to point that out. Um, 
And again, the usual rules of evidence do not apply in a grand jury proceeding. This is not a trial, so it's more loose. You're actually going to hear a lot of video evidence because ultimately when we were looking for witnesses and things like that, they were intimidated uh, from being this part of this process because of threats from the state, um, fear of retaliation and things like that. But because it's the grand jury proceeding, we are able to look at hearsay evidence and other forms of evidence which can take the place as actual live testimony. Um, you should not expect to hear all the evidence. We're, unlike uh, Robert McCullough's grand jury proceeding, we're not going to inundate you with 5,000 pages worth of documents. We're just going to give you the pertinent evidence that you're going to need to uh, show probable cause. You will not hear any evidence in defense of the accused. That doesn't happen usually in a grand jury proceeding. Uh, although Robert McCullough, if you um, you know saw the tra you know transcripts and things like that, he definitely uh, cross-examined some witnesses, but as opposed to Darren Wilson and other witnesses, he didn't. Um, I want to also say, in the original grand jury proceeding, the jurors were given incorrect instructions about uh, the controlling law on the use of deadly force by a police officer. We've given you copies of the correct prevailing law uh, in that case, so you can have that to uh, deliberate on. And lastly, we just want you to take notes, um, and again, you can ask questions after every witness and after every video testimony. Um, thank you, and we're going to begin the proceeding. Questions about the videos, please come up to the mic. Everything she said kind of collaborated with Darren Johnson said, uh, I mean Dorian Johnson said, uh, for us him running away from the police. But even with those two, Michael Brady said that, um, the two white officers that did not want to be identified. So at this point, from all the evidence we've seen, it clearly states he was running. Um, I want to also go back to the police um, said his head was banged. Um, I'm sure, as per Tiffany said, that they were playing tug of war. We all know playing tug of war. I make it fall, I make it, so he could have hit his head. That is possible if he was playing tug of war. Um, the white Monte Carlo, has anybody tried to find that witness? Because they were a key witness if they were right behind that police car. That white Monte Carlo. Um, per Tiffany, once again, he got right out of the court. So um, if he had time to think, that's what he said, split second, he had a time to think. That's premeditated in all the criminal law cases. I studied in school having a criminal law degree. Uh, that's premeditated because you had time to think. Um, back to Michael Brady. Uh, he, they took off running. He said both of them took off running. Um, Doran said himself that um, he didn't know if it was going to be him or Mike Brown that was shot. At. So they both took off running. So you had time to think about which one you were going to shoot at. Um, Could he have taken refuge in his vehicle? You could have called for backup. You could have stayed in your vehicle and called for backup if you truly was assaulted. But instead, you decided to apprehend or shoot or kill or whatever he did. He, you know, he could have taken refuge in his vehicle. Um, the white officers, I found it very interesting. They used words like staggering. So they saw staggering. They know what staggering is. Um, they also said that he was a walking dead man. So they saw him as, what was his name? Um, Michael Brady say, as he staggered and fell down or was going down. So those white office, I mean white workers saw the same thing. And they even said he was not a threat. So the, the, those are all the things um, that I just wanted to point out. Uh, and then looking at all of the exhibits, different witnesses are giving 
their true analogy of what's going on, and I think that needs to really be documented. The words that are coming out, like the two white workers said, brains out of his body. That's something to know. This is what these people are actually seeing. They're not reading it out of a magazine. This is their analogy of what they're seeing. Uh, brains out of the body, then uh, even Tiffany, um, said tug of war, so these are words that they not just reading in the media and coming back and relaying to us. That's, that's great, that's, that's it, There are a number of things interesting about that testimony. It's essentially what he's, he said to the grand jury. Some of you probably read the transcripts. I've seen the transcripts. And um, whatever discussion, that, in fact, Stephanopoulos, as much as he was helpful uh, to Darren Wilson now, uh, even he uh, was uh, uh, gentler than uh, the actual discussions that came down in the grand jury. Stephanopoulos, of course, uh, he starts off clearly uh, concerned about the welfare of Darren Wilson. He, you know, was a nice guy who was going to take care of a baby. A baby, a little baby was injured and he, that's where he was going uh, to deal with. And you have uh, Darren Wilson who uh, is extraordinary in and of himself for a number of reasons and uh, I don't know who he would have been testifying to. He certainly wouldn't have talked to this grand jury in that fashion. But he looked at this black man and saw in his face a demon, which is extraordinary. And clearly, uh, the kind of language used to inflame uh, opinion in white people about black people who might be 6'4 and big. And, uh, but Darren Wilson, uh, he talked about how he was struck uh, by uh, Mike Brown, who was doing a juggling act uh, with cigarillos, hit him uh, with one hand and then throw the cigarillos in the other hand and then hit him with the other hand uh, back and forth. And it's worth noting that there was no uh, evidence of cigarillos in the automobile, the Tahoe uh, that people refer to as the police car, this Tahoe. There was no evidence of broken cigarillas, uh, uh, anything like that in the vehicle. But Darren Wilson is quite heroic. And uh, he suffers these blows. Uh, and he states in his testimony before the grand jury that he's hit several times. He's trying to fend off these blows. And uh, uh, he was afraid that if he got hit again, he would lose consciousness or he might even die. This is in the testimony and the transcript. He might even die. That's how, how, uh, how hard he was hit. He's a different kind of white guy in the sense that uh, immediately after that, you know, he finally does get to the hospital and you see what's supposed to be the, the evidence in terms of the pictures taken uh, of him being hit by this powerful, he said, I felt his power. He said, I felt like a five-year-old trying to hold on to Hulk Hogan, but he's hit me so many times that I'm afraid I'm gonna lose consciousness or I may even die. And then you go and look for the evidence uh, in terms of the pictures, and uh, he's got a little rouge mark. There he is. This is immediately after he almost died. And he's in such, he's in a, such a bad situation that he hops out of his car after facing near death, after having almost been rendered unconscious, he hops out of his car, uh, able to chase Mike Brown. And, and, and given there was some conflicting testimony, he may have been walking behind Mike Brown, but he's capable of doing that and he's firing in total disregard for the entire population there. 
he sprang recklessly uh, his weapon several times. And uh, ultimately, of course, he kills Mike Brown. He sits in his car uh, until his supervisor arrives, he says. The supervisor arrives and then uh, tell Mike Brown, tell Darren Wilson, hop in your car, Darren, and drive to the police station. He's just faced near death. He's been hit so many times he might lose consciousness or might even die. He jumps out of the car, fires all of these rounds, kills Mike Brown, hops back in the car, waits for the supervisor to come. The supervisor, upon arrival, does not call for an ambulance, emergency, or anything like that. In fact, tells, tells Darren Wilson to get in my car, the supervisor's car, and drive it back to the police station. So this is how they thought, the supervisor thought, the kind of danger and problems he was confronted with, that he turns his car over to him and tells him to drive to the police station and then wait till somebody gets there uh, to talk to you. And what we're saying here is this is not a trial. What our objective is here, and here are pictures of Darren Wilson. He's been punched by somebody he felt like a five-year-old tussling with Hulk Hogan, who he thought may have killed him if he had hit him again. This is, this is how he looked after that confrontation. And uh, if you look at the transcript, you see that he gets tremendous assistance from the prosecutors. This is not a trial. The point that we want to make here is that there is probable cause to indict Darren Wilson for first degree murder. That, that is the main point. But there are other points that we will make during this process as well. Because Darren Wilson is a killer. And, and he's out there someplace. But he's not out there by himself. He has been rewarded with at least one million dollars by white people, including witness number 40, who testified before the grand jury. Uh, he has been rewarded. They call that, they say he, re they say he resigned, he retired with a golden parachute. He was rewarded. And I think it's important to make this statement. The statement was made for us by Stephanopoulos. And the way Stephanopoulos handled this, this case, this so-called interview, what kind of interview was that? We're in the face of the fact that rebellions are happening throughout the, uh, 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 this county. Rebellions are happening throughout the country because of this. And he treats this guy as his cousin when he's doing the interview. There's no real questions being asked there. And that's the problem, why it's necessary for us to look at this case. My name is Herdell Shep Bentham. And Ms. Bentham, can you tell us uh, your address? My address is 10072 Bond Oak Drive, St. Louis, Missouri. Ms. Bentham, what is your occupation? I'm a stay-home mom. And are you familiar with the, with the model that involves the death of Mike Brown? Yes. Well, Ms. Bellington, what, what, anything do you want to say to the grand jury today? Um, I wanted to talk about personal experience that I had with the police. And when you say personal experience, can you explain a bit more what you're, what you're talking about? Um, our incident that happened in 2009 with uh, Moly Nakers police. Uh, it was a situation where I was getting off work and I had a heart condition, so I was not feeling the best, so I was going home. But as I was driving, I felt uh, a little lightheaded, so I thought that it would be best for me to pull in a safe parking lot, uh, which was the library on um, 367. So I pulled over safely and called my family to tell them that I was feeling real lightheaded and I need someone to come. And as I sat there, I noticed that Moly Nakers police was behind me, came behind me. So I thought maybe they, you know, coming to help me. You know, my family called the police to give me some help. 
So he proceeded to come to my window and said, what the hell are you doing here? And I said, um, I pulled over because I feel real lightheaded. I had a heart condition explaining the situation. And he started calling me a lot of bad words, a lot of, I didn't, understand, I didn't even understand why he was cussing me out. And because I had a heart condition, I started going into panic. Uh, so I said, uh, sir, I'm real dizzy, I'm lightheaded. He's like, get out the car. And I was like, I can't get out the car. You know, you're making me real nervous. I don't know what's wrong. So he opened the door and he proceeded to pull me out. Um, at that time, I blacked out because I was already feeling lightheaded and had a heart condition. So I guess when he, you know, opened my door, it just made me, I just went out. Um, when I came to, I was on the, uh, I was in the hospital and um, the paramedics had to come and get me and uh, I ended up in the hospital for three or four days. Yeah, just, just so we can hear it, uh, hear it again, did you, what physical injuries did you suffer from that incident? Um, when I woke up, I had uh, bruises up and down my arm. My shirt was ripped off that I had on and I had bruises on my leg. My family member had came, you know, I had called my family, so they had came up to the police station looking for me. And when they came, she said I was out and I was on the ground at the police station and they were dragging me, calling me a lot of names. And she said, hey, that's my family, what are you guys doing? And he's like, this B is on drugs, you know, and she don't took something, that's what's wrong with her. So she called 911 on police for the paramedics to come and get me out of that situation. In, in regards to that particular incident, uh, was any legal action ever taken against the police? And what was the outcome of it if it, if it was? Sad to say, I called, every, I called every person that I could call. I called news, I called everybody, trying to tell them what happened to me. And nobody did anything or I didn't know what else to do. So no legal actions were took against me or the police. Ms. Benton, do you have any other incidences with you and the police? Unfortunately, I do. Uh, can you tell us about that? Um, I was living in New York. I had got married and was living in New York. I came to visit my family. Uh, as I was here visiting my family, my sister was driving, and we was in Ferguson, leaving Campfield Drive apartments and we got pulled over by Ferguson police. And the Ferguson police officer pulled us over, asked for my sister identification and everything. I was a passenger, he asked me for mine. I asked him why. He said, because I told, I asked you, I, you know, I want to see your ID. I want to know who you are. And so uh, my sister was nervous. And so just to stop, I just gave him my ID. I had a warrant from, two, um, from 1997. I told him I was pregnant and uh, he didn't care. He was like, you're going to jail, you know, you have a warrant from 1997. I said, I didn't kill anybody, can't you give me a warning so I can just go back to court? He said, no, he placed me under arrest for the warrant that I had. Um, at that time, I started experiencing some cramping and um, I was feeling like something was wrong with the baby. Uh, I told the officer, at the time I was 20, 25 weeks pregnant, uh, he didn't care. My water broke. My cellmate, the people that was in the cell with me, was screaming, she needs some help. Her water just broke. Uh, they didn't do anything, so I, the warrant that I had was for Richmond Heights. So when Richmond Heights police came and seen the situation, they said, we not touching her. She need an ambulance. So they called. I end up in the hospital and I gave birth to my daughter at 27 weeks and she was two pounds and one ounce. Was any, in that incident, was any legal action taken against the police and what was the outcome? No, no legal actions were taken against the public. And Ms. Benton, do you have any other incidences that you would have had some contact with the police? Yes, unfortunately, yes. And can you, can you tell the grand jury that please? Um, it's not per se me, but what the police did to my brother. Um, my brother was killed in 95 because uh, he was a part of, you know, a gang. 
and they seen fit for him to not no longer exist. So they picked him up and dropped him off in neighborhood to neighborhood and put it out there that he was informant, that he was telling on people. So of course the streets talk when they were dropping him off in the wrong neighborhoods. And my brother was killed um, in 2005. Uh, no, nobody was brought to justice um, or anything was done about it because we all know who killed him. That's why nobody was brought to justice. Ms. Benton, you said that you were familiar with the, with the matter involving uh, the death of Mike Brown, right? Yes. And you, you're also familiar with the, uh, the people's protests, the, the demonstrations that have been going on? Yes. Uh, can you speak to us in terms of your involvement in that? Yes, um, because of my history and the relationship that I have had with the police and what I have seen in my community, uh, August the 9th, I was working at City Gear clothing store with a y'all and young people when I looked around and I looked at my cell phone and seen what had happened to Mike Brown. And I remember the young man coming into City Gear, you know, buying shoes and things like that. I instantly said to myself, I got to do something. I could not continue to let them kill our babies, kill our young people, and have this strange relationship with them, and nobody, everybody just go unpunished. So I um, got in the streets. Lastly, Ms. Uh, Ms. Benton, I know you're here today to, uh, to, to testify. Uh, is there any last words that you would like to say to the grand jury? This relationship that the African community has with the police has to stop. So that means each and every person here is responsible to make it stop. We can't continue on having this strange relationship like it's okay. So that means that all of us are responsible. I can't keep on having these things happen to me or people around me and think it's okay. So that's why I'm here with my time, my energy, and everything in me to say that this is not okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Bender. Next, we're going to have a uh, video testimony from Robert McCullough um, and the cross-examination by Molly Yishitelli. I want to thank you very much and express my appreciation uh, <coughs> to the jurors for your patience. And I'm glad that we had an opportunity to hear from Bob McCullough, um, even if it uh, happened under those most favorable circumstances, because the truth of the matter is that Bob McCullough was subpoenaed to appear here and before you and before this community. And it seems to us that his inability or unwillingness to be here uh, really raises serious questions about his capacity for truth and veracity. Uh, that I can't understand why he wouldn't come here. He said there in that discussion that he wanted to get the word out. He wanted to clear up all of the misconceptions that anybody might have had about what happened. And who was it that uh, was demonstrating in the streets and protesting uh, that outcome except this community? And so it seems to me that this is something that he would have really looked forward to <coughs> being able uh, to attend so that he could offer an explanation to uh, this community. I just want to make one or two points. Uh as uh, the lead prosecutor just uh, so eloquently laid out, Bob McCullough did not want an indictment. But I just want to pose a question going forward to our grand jury and the example of a uh, true grand jury here. And for future relationships between our community and the so-called judicial system. Given the fact that Bob McCullough was presented and we had, cannot forget that, fact that over a hundred some thousand signatures were presented to him to step down. In the face of that, he refused to do so. So that's in of itself speaks to his character. Going back in terms of he wanting to deal with the truth getting out, why did he not sit down with the people who early on had were involved in the rebellion? 
to, it's ironic, three days after the killing of Mike Brown, I'd be remiss to say this, in Clayton, with a mass demonstration in front of the Justice Center, there were a delegation of people proposed to go up to talk with him to help defuse the circumstance. Two Christian ministers' were, names were submitted. One Muslim name was submitted. A member of the Organization for Black Struggle was submitted. And myself, as representative of the Universal African People's Organization, was submitted. He sat down that he's willing to meet with the exception of Zaki Baruti. <laughs> Am I not a member of the community, one that's out there in terms of seeking justice? Then past that, though, we as a people, I would kindly suggest that any time there's a racial shooting going forward, along with our black jury composition, is that all juries need to be 50-50, black and white, when there's a white officer involved in the shooting death of a black man. That makes common sense in my estimation. Even though, as my brother pointed out, we need not have gone through the grand jury process. Why not put everything out on the table so that the public can be in judge? And let's bypass and get rid of the grand jury selection. But if we have to have it, then 50-50 when it comes to racial killings. Last but not least, he mentioned that there's over 50 cases that he investigated involving police officers. Am I right? I did hear that correct. It'd be interesting to see how many came with a conviction or a charge. So again, I just want to again veggie back on my good brother, the lead prosecutor, that Bob McCullough need to be on the real side, arrested, and put in jail himself. Back in session, uh, please take your seats. Uh, we're going to call former police officer Glenn Rogers to the stand. We ask that you remain standing and put your right hand up and be sworn in. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Okay, you can be seated. Glenn Rogers. And could you tell us your address? Where you from? Where you from? I'm on O'Fallon, Illinois. Okay, great. Um, and what's your occupation? I'm in marketing. I'm also a minister. Okay. And you were a former police officer? Yes. Okay. For how long? 22 years. And why did you choose a career in law enforcement? I actually, as an insurance agent, I got tired of being stopped by the police in North County. <laughs> and yeah, I used to drive a nice car, and I always got pulled over off of Hanley Road uh, for frivolous things. When they found out that I knew a few people, I didn't get tickets, but I got tired of the harassment. So I told my friend that was a chief, the chief of the police department at that time, that I wanted an, a badge as an auxiliary cop so that I could just pull it out and have some protection against um, driving while black. <laughs> okay. Um, what police agencies have you worked for? I work for the city of Berkeley. I work for Velda Village. I work for Wellston, Hillsdale, Country Club Hills, and Moline Acres. I did the Muni Shuffle, as they call it in this area. Okay. Um, and when were you appointed chief of police, and where was this? I was appointed in January, 2000, January the 21st, 2001, in the little village of Brooklyn. The mayor had a problem there, asked me to come in. I had actually retired out of police work at that time. Okay. Um, and why are you willing to give your professional testimony here? Because ever since, ever since I entered police work, 
I was amazed at the one-sided treatment that was levied against black people. And since most cops are not willing to talk, and they're in a clique, and I've been doing this when nobody cared, when there was no cameras, no media, in the St. Louis News, I'm doing what I've been doing ever since I started. Um, and you know about the events that happened on August 9th, uh, the death of Mike Brown? Yes, right? yes. Okay. Um, in your professional opinion, what would you say was some of the unusual aspects of this case? Okay, um, the fact that the gun jammed twice. Now, I know one of the people that was asking questions, one of the jurors wanted to know about a gun jamming and then firing and jamming and firing. That's a, it is, in training, you learn how to clear a gun jam. They call it tap, uh, tap rack, and bang. If it jams, you just simply, uh, you know, you tap it, you rack it again, and then you fire. Now, a jam is a common thing with guns. You know, particularly if they use old gunpowder, it's a common thing. But sometimes cops will fire guns uh, 20 or uh, 2,000 times and never get a jam. Depends on what gun it is. Some are more prone than others. But to have two jams in a short period of time is indeed highly unusual. Okay. Um, I spoke about the police report. Um, what's, what's the usual, uh, uh, you call the procedure for a police report and police incident report? Okay, I'm glad you asked that. People need to understand how the police report process works in St. Louis County because it's similar all over the country. Now, St. Louis County, they use what they call the CARE system. St. Louis City uses another in-house system. CARE is computer, computer uh, assisted report enhancement is what CARE stands for. Now, with the CARE system, how that works is a car, an officer has an event that takes place. Some, uh, sometimes they have incidents. With an incident, it's not required to do a full report. You just log it for maybe a person might need some insurance data or some proof that it happened or maybe a mother's returning a child or something. You just got to have a proof that it happened. No real report needed. So that's a little incident report. Sometimes they do an incident card or whatever. Uh, but a full police report is very critical that you understand the whole system is designed to clear the police officer. And let me tell you how it works all over the country. For example, if you're a police officer and you get involved in a situation, you are a regular officer, you turn in your report, and your report is to be done that day. If it's not done that day, it, at least the critical elements of time, date, who, what, when, where, and why is sketched so they don't have to pay you overtime and you can come back and complete it the next day. But let me tell you how it works. You, the responding officer, gets involved in the situation. You complete your report and you turn in your report to your sergeant. Your sergeant's job is to review your report for errors and omissions and incorrect things. So for example, officer you comes in and you turn in your report to sergeant me, I say, uh, for, say for example, you forgot to read the Miranda rights. Everybody's familiar with that. So I will say to you, officer you, I'm, I'm sure that you, uh, gave him his Miranda rights, didn't you? But you forgot to put it in the report. And you ring, it rings a bell. You may have clearly forgotten. You say, yeah, that's right. Just give me that back and I'll get it taken care of. No big thing. You give it back. You give your amended report. They'll give you your police report with scratches and red marks on it all over until it is complying to standards. So the sergeant looks at it and the sergeant um, says, well, this is okay. He submits it to the lieutenant. That's why you don't see most high-ranking officers on the street. Most of their job is reading police reports. And the chief is dealing with politics. So, so the lieutenant looks at it. He's been there longer than the sergeant. That's why he's a lieutenant, normally. And so he says, with his deeper critique and more experience with the courts, he says, well, 
Well, I see there was a juvenile sitting there in the, in the, in the uh, booking room. He tells the sergeant, you need to get this back to the officer because he needs to do something about this part of the report. You can't have a juvenile sitting there in there with the adult. So he kicks it back. Sergeant, you gets it, says, oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, let me go ahead and let me straighten that out. Is this lying or is it conforming to police protocol? Now, the captain gets an ultimately assistant chief and finally the chief puts his John Henry on it and it gets approved as a closed report where no more amendments are made to that report. Nothing else can be added to that report. Anything else after that has to be submitted in the form of a supplement to the original report. For example, the person that you were dealing with, his parents come to the station the next day and they say, hey, look, I've got to tell you such and such and such, and it was, might be critical to the case or whatever. So it's significant enough that you have to do a supplement to that original report, and a lot of times it's listed as an S. Same report number with an S. One of the questions I had about this Michael Brown case was, there's a lot of talk about the original reports, but I'm more concerned about the supplemental reports of all of these cops that responded to the scene. Mm -hmm. Because these cops that responded to the scene, I think that's why they had to have it all, you know, took so much time to get it to comply. Because at that point, you've got a lot of different people, and you can't have contradictions if you understand how it works. I see that we have been tasked with looking at first or second degree murder only. My question is, <coughs> even if this were a, a, a legal, a there, a white folks grand jury, um, are we far reaching in not seeking manslaughter? Because at least if we go after manslaughter, we can kind of play their game and get some stuff, get, get some of those lesser charges. May not be what we want specifically, but at least there would be some time served. Because of that use, what is it, the police force, excessive force thing? Because of the way that's worded, and you said if the police officer feels, his feelings can say his use of force was justified. If he says that, that your actions were consistent, for example, if you move your body in a way that's consistent with a person that would move their body to get a gun, that could be justifiable. But right now, when it comes to the Darren Wilson case, you can't do anything but hope that they will uh, reconvene another grand jury. Right. And, then, and then on top of that, that, again, just because this is his saying, we also you know, put forward evidence to say that he had no fear for his life. You know, you gotta right. look at the evidence as a whole. And like probable cause, again, it's a very low standard. This is not a trial um, where you have a beyond a reasonable doubt from a probable cause standard where a reasonable, prudent person would believe that uh, Darren Wilson committed a crime. And that's, that's the standard you'd be looking at. So from that point of view, and we'll get into all that at the end of the instructions at the end, but from that point of view, we, we feel that man, you know, the manslaughter is, is not enough. That, First degree. Uh, the listening to Robert McCullough, he complained that there was so much conflicting testimony around the same questions uh, in his explanation for uh, the grand jury's determination not to indict uh, Darren Wilson. So they had to rely, he said, on forensic uh, evidence. And there was nothing that Robert McCullough said that was essentially different from what was just said now uh, by this uh, forensic pathologist. The difference being, of course, interpretation and the need for McCullough uh, to explain away the murder of Mike Brown and to exonerate uh, Darren Wilson. Uh, the whole discussion, uh, much of which, much of uh, being made of uh, by media, uh, by law, quote unquote, law enforcement forces that there might have been blood in the car, uh, 
Darren Wilson himself testified having fired uh, uh, at least one round. Uh, the uh, forensic pathologist uh, just now saying that part of, uh, of uh, Mike Brown's thumb uh, was missing, uh, having been uh, shot. And in fact, uh, uh, there was evidence that that shot happened at the car itself which would explain uh, if there were blood spat, uh, splatter or anything like that, if in fact there were um, some evidence of, uh, of, of, of Brown's presence in the car, that, that would obviously be an explanation. And if a grand jury uh, were involved in simply looking at uh, the basis for establishing probable cause, uh, then it seems clear to me that the evidence that they heard, not just this, but the evidence that uh, they got from other uh, pathologists uh, would have been sufficient. However, it, it seems clear that uh, McCullough and his uh, prosecutors uh, had a goal of interpreting uh, that uh, forensic evidence uh, in a fashion uh, that would make Mike Brown responsible for his own death. Uh, as opposed to uh, uh, Darren Wilson. I think that's really crucial, and I think that uh, any rational group of people listening to that, any group of people uh, from this community listening to that would have found it obscenely uh, 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 arrogant and totally uh, disdainful of black common sense to say that a man who has already been shot uh, chased by police, why would you run in the first place from somebody shooting at, at you and then suddenly turn around and then charge them? It seems clear that the forensic evidence substantiates, supports the testimony of everybody else that said uh, that Mike Brown was murdered uh, by Darren Wilson on August 9th, 2014. You know, as we would have indicated from the, from the beginning, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, uh, we submit that the, uh, the prosecutors in this matter corrupted this, uh, these proceedings. And as uh, the chairman would have said, they uh, totally disregarded what the science would have said. Uh, the science said that this would have happened a particular way, and they, uh, they, put, their own, they put their own twist on the science. So, but, but these are the things that we would want you to, to, to deliberate on. And, uh, and to come to a proper decision. Is there any more uh, questions or, 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 or comments uh, from the jury? The uh, jury is satisfied with that evidence? We're going to move on, continue with the grand, uh, black grand jury proceedings, ladies and gentlemen. The next uh, testimony that we will be hearing is from St. Louis County Prosec Prosecuting Attorney Robert McCulloch. Actually, we're going to move forward and have the live testimony of Von Derek Myers' mother. Um, we're going to ask her to come up and be sworn in. You can remain standing and put your right hand up. Uh, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Okay, you may be seated. So, no cop came to us. We was hearing the story from witnesses and people that were standing out there and other family members. And it was said that Von Derek was in the store with his friends and he was buying a sandwich. They got out the store. He split the sandwich with the friends that was out there. They proceed to go to another friend's house, and this when this cop came, he shot my son seven times from the back. <clears throat> One of the bullets hit him in the femur, which is the largest thigh bone in your body. Von Derek was then on the ground begging and pleading for his life, asking this cop why is he doing this to him, who is he, because at that time they didn't even know he was a cop. He never identified himself as a cop, he was dressed in all black. So as the witness watched, 
The cop then reloaded his gun, walked up to Von Derrick, because Von Derrick was on the top of the hill. The cop was down on the hill. So all Von Derrick wounds was in an upright projective. The, he then reloaded the gun and shot Von Derrick in the head, which took his life. Could you say your name for the record? Von Derrick Myers Singer. Okay. Um, and where are you from? St. Louis, Missouri. Okay. Um, and, and what did you want to add to this matter that your wife just uh, I just want the people to know that uh, throughout this whole look thing with this, this cop and my kid, that um, they said that they found a gun and he's allegedly shot at the police officer with. They first claimed it was a 9mm Ruger. Then later on, they claimed that it was a Smith & Wesson Ruger, I mean 9mm. And then furthermore, if he took shots at the cop, why wasn't his fingerprints on the gun. Mm -hmm. His DNA, none of that was on the gun. Okay. And that's what I want to add to uh, what my wife was talking about. Okay, okay. Brother Myers, uh, also Brother Mufasa. That's right. Okay. First of all, as a father to another father, I express my deepest and I've been where you are. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, and to the mother also. Uh, if there was coming out of the, this grand jury that you wanted to send a clear and loud message to the grand jury as well as the audience and the people worldwide who's listening to this, what would be your message in regard to the issue that you have now felt as far as racial profiling, racial brutality, and murder? So I want the people to understand, do not allow these people to keep manipulating our minds as grown people that have been out here and knowing the brutality is out here, just stand for something or die for nothing. You know what I'm saying? That's what I will say to the people. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Just one question and then we're going to close for the day. Go ahead, sir. You want to come to the mic? Go to the mic, brother. Go to the mic. I need to hear it. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, brother. You know? Check, check, check. Okay. What I was saying is we must continue to apply the pressure, the new word. And you better listen to what the word is. The new word, move forward. Stinger just took over uh, uh, office out there for Charlie Dooley. Every time you see someone, we want to get past Ferguson. We want to move forward. No, you're not going to move forward until you handle this issue here at hand. Right we want some justice, right and we want it now. Bob McCullough, goodbye. goodbye. Don't stop. Then you go to Jeff City again because that's the one that controls everything here. So just remember, when somebody tells you we're going to move forward, can't move forward until we deal with what's here on hand. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers, sisters and brothers, thank you very much for Three. the next witness that we have here that we're going to Who's going to take the stand is uh, Mike Brown's uncle, Mr. Bernard Ewings. Can you stay standing and I'll raise your right arm, please? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God? You may be seated. Sir, can you tell the court your full name, please? Yeah, my name is Bernard Ewings. I'm Michael Brown's uncle. I'm Leslie Brown's brother. And I stay in Ferguson. And Can you tell us your occupation? I work with mentally and or, and or physically challenged adults. So you said the, the, you said that the, the deceased Mike Brown, that's your nephew. Yeah, that's my nephew. And the whole summer I was basically with him every day other than when I was at work. But I work like 70 hours a week. Because he was over my mother's house, which stays in Northwind Apartments, that's on Canfield Drive. 
And when, when was the last time, if you can recall, that you saw Mike Brown? Uh, the night before, I seen him the day before he was killed, which was August 8th. And I had came home from work, because I do overnights also. And I stopped by my mother's house, because I was moving that day. And I came to my mother's house, but she wasn't there, no one was there. And I was getting some things ready, and my girlfriend was coming with a truck to help me move. And my mother and sister arrived, and they said they just had seen Michael Brown up the street. And I was getting in my car because I was headed to work, and I was going to ask them to help me move because my girlfriend was bringing a truck. And as I was pulling out uh, Northland Apartments on the Canfield, I seen my girlfriend running down Canfield, screaming, calling my name. And at first, I ain't recognized it because I was expecting her to come in the truck. Then I looked again and I seen her then. I asked her what was wrong, and she was crying. She was like, Mike, Mike, daddy up the street. And I pulled up the street, and it was one police car with the tape out and one paramedic, and like two people on this side of the apartment, and two people on that side. And I walked under the tape, and I was walking towards him, and I seen him laying down, face down like this, and blood coming out, flowing this way. And I was like, who, I was calling, I was like, where is friend at, named Vira? They was always together. And then I was like, who did this? Who did this? And I was like, a cop did this. I was like, a cop did this? Where, where the cop at? And they was like, he ran off. And as I was looking at the scene, then it, all the Caucasian people that there were the cop police officers and the permit. And it was like about four to five people on each side, because this apartment's on both sides of the street. And when I got up there, I was like one of the top ten people to get up there. So I don't know where Mr. McCullough got 60 witnesses from. And it, witness number 40, it definitely was no white woman up there. Some Caucasian people came later. They were cameramen and other police officers and other paramedics. But then after we got up there, you know, then my mom and them came up there, more police came and they roped it off. And the whole time they left his body laying out there, the police were making racial slurs towards the people, laughing at the situation. And then you could see what happened based on the evidence. Like if West Florida was up here, down there where the initial contact came, you could see my nephew hat was laying right in the middle of the road. Then back towards, uh, away from West Florida, about five yards down was his flip flops, right in the middle of the road. Then farther down, another 10 yards was his body, but his body was turned back facing West Florida. That's when he turned around. And they saying that my nephew rushed Officer Darren Wilson. When I got up there, I looked clearly. Because the tape, went, they kept pushing the tape back further and further. I walked right up on my nephew. It wasn't no blood behind him. All the blood was where he was laying, coming out his head area, flowing back towards West Floors. And when... Uh, the chief of police, he clearly on TV saying Darren Wilson knew nothing of a robbery call. But now Darren Wilson's whole basis was, hey, I got a call and he fit the description. And let's be honest, he didn't say get out the street. He said get the fuck out the street. And he also ran over my nephew's foot. But they never did an autopsy on to see a body had a foot contusion. That's what my nephew said to him. And he did not peacefully turn back around. You can still today see the time watch where he screeched his tires out trying to bust a you to get back to them. 
had when they had them left out there for four and a half, five hours as the police were making racial slurs and causing commotion. All we was asking him was get his body out the street. I begged and pleaded with several officers. Talk to them calm, cool professionals. That they say, oh, we got to take pictures. It's an investigation. But I look around, why nobody taking pictures? Everybody's standing up there talking. You know, and then at the end, it was like 10 police on this side, 10 police on this side. And they had a long, like, cover like 10 yards long on both sides of my nephew laying in the middle. And they walked right up to him and all of them held them covers up real high. I guess so somebody couldn't see what they doing. I assume that's when they put the blood behind them if they got pictures of it. Cause there wasn't no blood behind him. Like the if the witness say he turned around and charged another 25 to 30 feet at Don Wilson after he was already shot, it would be at least a drop of blood behind him. And also, when the chief of police got there, and he claimed Darren Wilson was still there, no, he was not. And when he took Darren Wilson's statement, he did not record it or write it down. And then when he let the county take over, the county investigator talked to Darren Wilson. He did not record his statement or write it down. Now, if I got in trouble with the police and I'm in evidence room, what they gonna do? Record my statement. They let Darren Wilson put his own gun in the evidence thing and wash the blood from his hands. So I can't believe that my nephew just hopped in his car and attacked him like that. And he talking about he had the strength of Hulk Hogan and he was like a five year old. Well, how did you wrestle the gun back from my nephew, because you claim my nephew had the gun from you. Now, I ain't strong as Hulk Hogan, but if a five-year-old, if I took a gun from a five-year-old, they couldn't get it back from me. I'm sorry. And if Hulk Hogan punched me, now Hulk Hogan supposed to be on this side of me. How did I get a little paper cut on this side? But he punched me as hard as he could to the point where he thought he was going to knock me out. And then also, when he said the initial contact when they had the altercation, I don't think my nephew reached for his gun. I think he had his gun out and my nephew put his hand up to block it. Like, what the hell are you doing? And also, when he said he didn't have time to think about getting his, well, he didn't have a taser or his um, flashlight or his billy club while they were in altercation. Well, after my nephew ran from you, after you shot him, you had plenty of time to get your billy club, call for backup, your mace, but now you got your gun. You know why? Because you felt like you was disrespected. That's all. Just like two men in the street. One can't take a, a butt kicking, so they got to go get a gun. He did not do it like police work at all. And he knew it, and all the police knew it, and they just doubling back around. We got them on camera saying the chief, he didn't know nothing about a robbery. But now, uh, he had got a call about a robbery and hit my nephew for the description. So which one is it? So that right there alone was enough to take it to trial. And I could go on and on about a hundred more things. The 40 witnesses, 60 witnesses, but they didn't call me. I was in the top 10 people up there, but I didn't see what happened when it happened. But I was up there like right after it happened. But the people that was there when it happened, Mr. McCullough, he did not ask them questions about, okay, what happened? He asked them about what happened before and what happened earlier or after or what happened with their personal lives, trying to discredit them. But the other 45 to 50 people that didn't see nothing, he put on the stand and say, okay, what happened? They didn't know, but the people that did know, you didn't want to talk about that that happened. You want to talk about everything else to them, like Dorian Wilson. 
You want to talk about the store robbery, his past, what type of person he is? But you don't want to talk about what happened, though. First, you want to discredit him. Then you want to ask him what happened. But then you want to ask everybody who didn't see it, just heard about it, uh, what happened. So you could discredit him right off the bat because they didn't see it. You know, he played a true game. But you're playing with people's lives. And he know it. And everybody in the whole world know it, man. It's cause like day. What are we gonna do about it? I know what I would like to do about it, but hey, that's one war I probably can't win by myself. But if all of us get together, we could do something about it. But we gotta get together though. You straight up. You you had stated that uh, the police was using racial slurs. What what exactly do you mean by that? Giving us a middle finger, calling me. They personally called me nigga. Gave me the middle finger. Said they glad my nephew did. Laughing at me and everything else. I don't already got no altercation with one of the cops. And if you were to see these police officers again, you would be able to recognize them? Yes, I would. Do yes, you, I would. Do you know any of their names and their barge numbers? No, I don't, because they would not give me that information okay. during that time. And can you just briefly uh, tell us what kind of young man was your nephew? He was real smart. He was real good with computers. And he wasn't no, he wasn't no gangbanger or no... The, he, well, he ain't even like to fight. He, I think he had like one fight his whole life. He was cool. Like, you know how big people be around you and you be like, oh, I gotta watch this big dude. But you be around him, you like, oh, he cool, you know? He with me. He wasn't no, he wasn't no, he wasn't no shit starter. He got along with everybody. Everybody came in contact with him, ended up being his friend. So, that right there, I think I think what happened was Don Wilson come rolling down the street, probably ran over my nephew's foot, probably didn't. Say, get the fuck out the street. And they said something or something that he ain't like. He, oh, what? Busted at you, got back on him, what you say? Then he probably tried to open the door and it hit my nephew, because that's what Don Wilson said. While he trying to get out, the door hit him, bounced back on him, so now he mad. And like Dorian said, he had his arm out the car window around my nephew's neck. My nephew probably was like, damn, what, get off me. And he got his gun out. Like, you better get back or I'll shoot. And my nephew probably like, damn, hold up. And he shot him. And then my nephew running. So Dorian Wilson, well, so you know you want, he want an arm. If he, and but then when you talking about he turned around and Reach down for his waistband like he had something. He would have shot you at the car if he had something. And then you claim he had time to wrestle with you while he wrestling with you at the car. Take the cigarettes, turn around, hand them to Dorian Wilson, and still be wrestling with you and get back to wrestling with you. And it's a grown ass man. Now, I know my, my nephew. My nephew was big, but he never did work out. I just wanted to play football. So, that ground master ain't even kick in on him yet. And when them bullets hurt him, hit him, I know they hurt. Because he ain't muscular, nothing to eat one of them. Even if you muscular, nine, come on, man. Who finna turn around and get shot three times with a nine and come on and try to charge somebody, man? Like they said, he turned around saying, okay, okay, with his hands up. But Darren Wilson, in a rage, just because he felt like he didn't get the ultimate respect of being a police officer, and this black man had the audacity to try to do him like that. Oh, I'm going to get him, I'm going to show him. And in a blind rage, he did what he did. That's it. Brothers and sisters of the Black People's Grand Jury, I'd like to get their attention. Um, first of all, I want to express my appreciation uh, to you for taking this time uh, out of your lives to come and participate in this procedure and uh, for taking this process as seriously as obviously uh, those of us from the prosecutor's team uh, take this case. 
So I, I want to commend you uh, for that and express my deep and most profound appreciation for that. And I also have to extend my appreciation to the prosecutors, uh, uh, one of whom, uh, Alex Morley, a uh, lawyer who traveled here uh, from the Bahamas to participate in this process, and we're highly appreciative of that. There are some people who were clamoring, who thought that we needed a quote-unquote outside uh, prosecutor, somebody uh, who was not here, didn't know Darren Wilson, and uh, didn't know Bob McCullough, anybody like that, and uh, Alex Morley is that person, uh, is one of those persons. And then, of course, uh, we have uh, with us Aaron O'Neill, who uh, practices law uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, and uh, uh, we have with us Zaki Baruti, who uh, has earned uh, his right uh, to be here uh, through a consistent struggle in the interests of our people. All of these uh, folk who are uh, functioning as prosecutors uh, can be recognized as somebody who struggles in the interests of our people. And I think that make, make, makes what they are uh, offering us uh, all the more significant. And in the term, in the uh, situation with uh, Alex Morley and Aaron O'Neill, uh, obviously uh, these are not ordinary lawyers. Uh, who accept uh, some kind of role and responsibility as, as officers of an oppressor uh, state apparatus. They've come here uh, to serve the people, and we are highly appreciative of that. I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad that uh, one of the grand jurors, one of you raised the question of uh, other charges. And uh, one reason I'm glad that occurred is because I heard another suggestion earlier on that perhaps the grand jury should rule uh, in a way that there's a greater likelihood that the state would appreciate it and might do something uh, for us. And I want to suggest to you uh, that this grand jury should go and deliberate, but you should not be intimidated by any assumption that this grand jury is impotent. You cannot, you cannot go and deliberate with the assumption that as opposed to applying the law to the facts, let's come up with something that somebody is going to appreciate and be more likely to say it was all right for us to do this. We cannot see our responsibility here with this grand jury as coming up with a solution that pleases someone. Our responsibility is to do what we saw a grand jury under the authority of St. Louis County and Robert McCullough. Under their authority, they refused to apply the law to the facts to the facts. And what we are saying is that we are here today in part as a criticism of that process. Therefore, we cannot do less than that. We cannot do less than applying the law to the facts. The facts we believe, we've shown here, not only through direct evidence coming from, pathologists, path, uh, uh, from forensics, pathologists, not only from testimony from, that we saw with video, from Doran Johnson and other witnesses who saw what happened. Not only that, but what we did was show that there is a tendency, a trend, a tradition here in this county for doing what happened to Mike Brown. That, that Darren Wilson was not acting as an outlaw. He was not acting as a rogue cop. He was doing what police do to black people in this county. We show that evidence right here. We've had people who sat at that witness stand, at this witness stand, 
and say they shot my son 21 times and they still haven't told me anything that allows me to understand why they did it. We've had witnesses who've talked about other relatives being killed and brutalized in this county. So we're not talking about some aberration. We are saying that Darren Wilson did it. We're saying that not only did he do it, but the cover-up was enacted. First, by the grand jury process itself. By the fact that it even went to a grand jury, as opposed to Robert McCullough using the power to take it to a preliminary hearing. So that there could have been a debate an examination of the evidence, cross-examination, the rest of it. He didn't do that. He took it instead to a grand jury, which is a prosecutor's tool. It is a tool of the prosecution that has led to statements by noted attorneys that a grand jury will indict a ham sandwich. So if a prosecutor wants an indictment, he will get an indictment. We also remind it that a grand jury is not a trial. It is not there for the purpose of examining all the evidence. It is for the purpose of establishing probable cause for an indictment. We didn't throw 5,000 pages of anything at you. I think that a real clear case was presented to you over the last day and a half that would justify your coming back after deliberation with a, with a declaration that Down Wilson is guilty of first degree murder. I also think that it is possible for you to consider the role played in this process by Bob McCullough. The arrogance, hypocrisy, the lying, all of which have happened in the face of what is assumed to be a black community without power to deliver consequences. Nobody does this to a community that they assume can deliver a consequence. It's based on the assumption that they can do it and there's nothing that you can do about it. This grand jury says that is a lie that there is something that we can do about it. You have to, in my estimation, come back with the determination that Darren Wilson is guilty, or should be rather, indicted for first degree murder. Also the question is, well, should we do it? I mean, if Robert McCullough had determined that Darren Wilson should have been indicted. They had the guns. They had the authority. They had the ability to go and arrest him and throw him in jail and they could do those things. And we look at ourselves, we don't have the guns. And from their perspective, when I say there, I'm talking about St. Louis County. I'm talking about the state, and I don't just mean the state of Missouri, I mean the state, the entire apparatus of coercion that is in control of the ruling class. They have all of those tools and weapons. So why should you do it? Why should you, why should you then say he should be indicted? Because we have shown you, on the one hand, the same basic evidence that was used by Robert McCullough to those 12 people in November. The same evidence, and they've come to a conclusion that exonerated, rewarded Darren Wilson for the murder of an 18-year-old black child. They've done that. You have an opportunity to do something different. If, in fact, they have the power to carry out their will, when I say they in this instance, I'm talking about St. Louis County. I'm talking about the whole state. I'm talking about those forces with the monopoly on violence. They have a monopoly on violence. That's what the state is. If they have the power to carry out their will 
and they can make determinations that are designed to keep you oppressed. Can anybody doubt the determination that came from St. Louis County Grand Jury was designed to keep us oppressed, to keep the Michael Browns of our community dying without any kind of recourse? If they have the ability to do that, and we say that we have to move to correct that, and we use a grand jury to do this. This is a step in the process of capturing power in our own hands to carry out the mission. You can't carry out the mission if you don't start. You can't move to do anything to Darren Wilson and the rest of them if you don't start. You've got to start somewhere and you've got to say we're taking control of this in our own hands as an oppressed community that we do find that Darren Wilson should be indicted for first degree murder of Michael Brown on August 9th. That is the beginning. That is the recommendation that's coming from these prosecutors. Thank you very much.